Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. Just last night, Fort McMurray in Alberta, or Fort Mac for short, suffered an inferno. The surrounding uh, woods caught fire, the fires jumped across roads and went into the town and it destroyed many structures and the entire town of 80,000 people had to be evacuated. Now, there's two ways to look at this tragedy. One is, you know, fires happen, it's just a tragic thing. But that really ignores the big picture. And the big picture is that we're undergoing abrupt climate change right now, globally, and we need to declare a climate change emergency. And the, the incineration of Fort McMurray is just one other incident in the climate casino of a town dropping because of uh, climate events from abrupt climate change. So basically overnight, 80,000 people were evacuated. So Canada suddenly has 80,000 climate refugees from Alberta. We've taken in a lot of refugees from Syria, and those are climate refugees because there was a drought in that country from 2006 through 2010, the, the, the worst drought in, in their history, and it took away the livelihoods of one and a half million farmers who moved to rural areas, there were no jobs, and the city basically started collapsing as a result of that. We need to connect the dots. We need to look at the big picture of things. We are in a global climate emergency. So what happened um, in Fort Mac is basically temperatures in the last little while have been in the, in the low 30 degrees Celsius, which for early May is unheard of. So these high temperatures combined with lack of rainfall have put tremendous stress on the surrounding vegetation in the region. What is ironic, of course, is that Fort McMurray um, houses all of the workers uh, for the uh, Alberta oil sands, which is the single most, uh, pro you know, most polluting project for, as far as climate change is confer con concerned. The oil from the tar sands takes tremendous amounts of energy to extract and causes tremendous amounts of greenhouse gases. So this is all part of a larger uh, changing climate system and we've definitely got into an abrupt mode. Greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide are increasing exponentially. In fact in 2015 the CO2 level rose 3.05 parts per million which is the largest ever. Um, so it's so the, we're, we're supposedly reducing fossil fuel emissions around the planet, but what is key, what is important is the CO2 levels in the atmosphere, and those are still rising exponentially as our methane. So what has basically happened is that uh, we've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere and the oceans with our emissions. We've caused a warming of the planet, but the Earth is a heat engine that uh, absorbs energy, we get so it's heated by solar energy and that heat is distributed around the planet. The equator of course is much warmer than the poles but the poles are mostly like for example the Arctic is covered with snow for large parts of the year and the sea ice covers the Arctic Ocean. These are very light surfaces which reflect a lot of solar radiation which keeps those regions cold but now because of the loss of sea ice and snow cover the region is darkening, absorbing more and more solar radiation and heating up. So the temperature difference to the equator is much is greatly reduced and that is what is responsible for setting up the jet streams which drive weather patterns around the planet. So what's happened in Fort Mac is it's in a blocking pattern, a blocking ridge. So it's extremely high temperatures, extremely dry. This has caused great stress on the vegetation, drying it out. Not only that, but the trees have been stressed for many years because of the pine beetle, because of the emerald ash borer, and because of other, other, uh, other creatures that, that uh, damage the trees that used to be killed off in cold winters and no longer are because of climate change. So we need to keep the climate system in perspective, in, 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 in mind, because these events like Fort McMurray succumbing to fire, you know, uh, it, 
it, just a few weeks ago it was Houston that was completely flooded out. You know, the center of the oil industry and a, a large part of the oil industry in the U.S. was flooded out. These events are happening more and more frequently with more and more severity. And this is only the tip of the iceberg, the proverbial iceberg, because things are going to ramp up and accelerate um, at much, much higher rates as we move forward. There is a real and present danger of losing Arctic sea ice this summer. If we lose Arctic sea ice by September and we have this first blue ocean event, then these weather patterns, the jet stream patterns will fracture more, we'll have more ridges and troughs, more extreme weather events around the planet, um, and fires is just one aspect of these extreme weather events. So the Earth systems are being severely stressed. The largest ecosystem on the planet, the Great Barrier Reef in California, basically suffered a massive bleaching event this year, and lots of that coil will die. Look deeper, 25% of all the fish in the ocean spend part of their lifestyle on coral reefs. With dead coral reefs, how will these fish survive? What's uh, in the cards is a collapse of the entire marine food chain. Uh, a paper just came out um, last week talking about oxygen levels in the ocean. And because the oceans are warming and stratifying and there's less mixing in the vertical direction, so oxygen from the surface is not getting down into deeper waters and this is putting great stress on the fish. So as tragic as Fort McMurray is, as tragic as the fire there, is we're seeing fire outbreaks around the world. How many people, how many Canadians know of the massive fires that have been ongoing in the Himalayas for the last month? And they don't have any water there to put out those fires. And those fires are because the temperatures are extreme, it's extremely warm. Hi everybody. Uh, the video cuts off there uh, abruptly, but I, I wanted to run everything that that climate scientist had to say I know that we're all here and happy, and we're excited about Bernie Sanders' win in the Indiana primary, and I know that uh, we're very excited about his rally tonight and uh, moving on into Guam and West Virginia coming up and what we have to look forward to in our political revolution. But I want to remind everybody tonight that uh, we are in the midst of a climatary crisis. Uh, Wildfire rips through a Canadian city, forcing 80,000 people to flee. This 100-year uh, floods, Houston had three of them. How many, uh, what are they calling, extreme weather events are we going to have before our government actually realizes that we need a D-Day on climate? We need to act quickly. The Paris Climate Agreement, and I just want to cover this for the record before we move on, uh, Paris Climate Agreement does absolutely nothing. Now, it did nothing before. Now it does even less, right? It's nothing is halved, if that's possible. It's actually not in math, uh, not in normal math. Uh, fossil fuel use must fall twice as fast as thought to contain global warming. Uh, they've realized that their numbers are off. I've been saying this for a while. This article came out in February. And we've seen the effects of that. We've, in one month, March devastated our environment. We haven't even begun to see the lasting effects of what happened in March. The coral bleaching, the Houston floods, these fires, the Arctic ice. You realize there was a period there where it was, it was uh, warmer in the Arctic than it was in Texas, certain places. That's, that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, we're excited that Bernie's coming up. I'm watching, I'm monitoring here. We've got uh, News Universe channel. Let me know what's going on. Uh, 238 out there, clear audio. Thank you so much, Jesse, for letting me know. And we've got Liam and Mickey hanging out here in the back room, just checking things out. And uh, I, I, I know, I know that, that we need to focus on Bernie Sanders, focus on the effort, getting delegates, uh, getting out the vote, doing everything we need to do, phone bank, face bank. We have to do these things, and then we have to remember that we are in a planetary crisis and that uh, we need somehow to get all governments together to recognize that we are not going to last on any of their ridiculous long-term plans. We've got about 10 years to end our use of fossil fuel and to reduce, dramatically reduce, the amount of CO2 in the air. Right? 
and uh, we are what we're seeing right here, as he said, as the as the the scientist said, as the scientist said, uh, we're in deep shit, basically what he said. So uh, Colorado, just to shift really quickly uh, as we wait for the stream to start, Colorado, uh, the Supreme Court just decided that even though cities uh, are banning fracking in the interest of uh, cl climate change, in the interest of, of saving the planet, the Supreme Court's going to null those and say, we're going to frack on your land anyway. Screw you, because we can, because Colorado makes a lot of money from the gas and oil industry, and we're not offering them any alternative there. So, uh, yeah, just wanted to share that good news. These are some pictures from the Fort McMurray fire. I don't want to get into that just yet. I'm waiting for, uh, here's our stream. As you can see, hasn't started yet. We're in a multi-target needed time frame. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely go time. How's everybody out there doing? I think Sekmar is a comment mod. Uh, Sekmar and Ryan and Liam. Thank you guys for our, being our comment mods. Wrench is out there. Thank you so much. How are you doing, everybody? Teresa, Andrew, Zox, Bluegrass, Sek, Jill, Safari, Nicole, Chikulian, Ashish, Nikolai, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Good to see you. Got Bernie Sanders coming up here real soon. Uh, got a bunch of different options here to watch the stream on, and it'll, it'll show up here any second. But you know how he is. Sometimes. Sometimes he runs late. You never know. Uh, let's see. What can we talk about? How about the fact that uh, Hillary Clinton kind of going down in flames? Things are starting to stack. Uh, she's got a lot of issues, a lot more issues, if you aren't, if you aren't caught up with the latest scam. We've got a, a lot of scams and issues that Hillary's got to deal with at this point. And the latest one is the fact that they've caught uh, her uh, not really raising a lot of money for down-ticket candidates, as George Clooney thought uh, uh, she was. Most of that money, 88% of that money that she was raising for down-ticket candidates in, in the Democratic Party, actually going right back to her because they need every dime they can. I believe uh, we're, we're at $155 million spent on Clinton's campaign to lose 50 points. That's, that's essentially what's happened. 155, you wanna know how well she will do in office? $155 million spent to lose 50 points in an election. And we're just getting started. Yeah. So, uh, what do we got? What are you guys saying? Let's address common. Hillary is a liar and a crook. Absolutely agreed, son. Let's do this for Bernie. Cal Fire is hiring. Interesting. I'm just reading out. So yeah, and drop out Hillary. I I, uh, I saw some comments about that being negative and we shouldn't focus on the negative. Well, right now, it's like kicking serious ass. I saw that drop out Bernie tried to trend for a moment and then it disappeared really quickly. Um, I'm just having fun with the truth. Drop out Hillary is a truth. It's not a insult. It's not mean. If we want to avoid Trump in office, we need to ask her. She needs to drop out. Bernie Sanders needs to be the focus of the Democratic Party because Bernie Sanders is the only one who is capable of beating Trump. Um, there's, a, there's a big factor here that is, is and it's, it's in this article here. It's, it, there's a lot. This is H.A. Goodman. There's a lot of different articles, but okay. Hillary does not have the support of independence. Bernie does. The only way we're going to get independence away from Trump is with Bernie Sanders. Uh, Republicans don't want Trump, but they definitely don't want Hillary. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of big reasons why Bernie Sanders is the only... Uh, Hillary is facing indictment. Hillary just got busted in a money laundering scheme with her foundation and with the DNC. And... Uh, Come on, how many things do you stack on? How many more things? If this were Bernie Sanders, she would have been toast. She would have been, uh, he would have been absolutely toast fr from the very beginning. And right now, Donald Trump, in one poll, is actually beating Hillary Clinton nationally. Okay? Bernie Sanders, on the other hand, beats Donald Trump decisively double digits. Hillary Clinton, not so much. Sean King just released an article it's out there. Uh, it's talking about the same thing. This is just the truth. If we don't want Trump in office, we have to put the person uh, in the Democratic Party. We have to nominate the person in the Democratic Party. They can actually defeat Trump. That is not Hillary Clinton. 
Bernie Sanders uh, is Donald Trump's nightmare. And Trump has said himself, I would prefer to run against Hillary. It'd be easier. Right? We haven't even seen what the Republican Party will pull out against Hillary Clinton. They could eviscerate her. We've already seen pretty much every attack that you can imagine against Bernie Sanders. He's been tried and tested against by the Hillary Clinton campaign. So we know what's coming. We know what can happen. We, 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 Bernie has had everything. We've done two kitchen sink episodes about the bullshit that Hillary and her uh, David Brock uh, companion have uh, thrown at Bernie Sanders. I don't think the Republican Party can throw anything else at Bernie Sanders at this point, but they sure can at Hillary Clinton. So, uh, and, and, and no, it won't be all of the Republican Party because I understand that they don't all like Trump and a lot of them don't like Trump, but there's plenty of PAC money. There's plenty of money that can be tossed at Hillary Clinton. Trump himself can spend all the money he wants and eviscerate Hillary Clinton. And he knows it. He absolutely knows it. And he can win independence. So, uh, really, seriously, Hillary needs to drop out for the sake of the nation. She needs to drop out for the sake of democracy. She needs to drop out because she has put herself in a very, very compromised position. She is uh, the second lowest in favorability ratings. Uh, Trump, the only one below her. That doesn't bode well. Why don't we put somebody against Trump who has great favorability ratings? That'd be Bernie Sanders. We have every logical reason at this point to put Bernie Sanders as a Democratic nomination. The only reason he won't be is because the establishment refuses to bow to the will of the people and logic at this point. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. It'll be interesting to see. It goes to tweet Trump. Nice. <laughs> never Hillary can do that too. Uh, never Hillary. I'm reading, just reading some of your comments, guys. What are we going on? Nothing has started yet, just so you know. It ha it's not up. I don't know what's going on. Anybody, if anybody finds a, uh, a, a stream of this, anybody knows it's happening, let me know. I'm not seeing it yet. I'm just going to check here. Nope. What else do we have to talk about? Here's five big reasons why Bernie Sanders uh, uh, wins big with Cruz. So you know that Ted Cruz dropped out. And next day, Kasich's out. All that's left is Trump. Here's, here's some of the factors there. Uh, news coverage for the Democratic primary and Bernie Sanders will increase because they won't have much to talk about with Trump. The, the other candidates may be on the tickets, but they're not going to be doing anything. Uh, Sanders will pick up a huge number of what would otherwise be Trump votes in states where voters are still able to register for upcoming Democratic primaries. Now, the other cool thing is, is that there's a lot of people asking their Republican friends to just go register Democrat and vote for uh, Bernie anyway because they don't like Hillary. And that works. Right? And we already know she doesn't have the youth vote. So uh, should be should be pretty good. What else? Clinton will have to start spending a great deal of money to fight a two-front war against Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is going to eviscerate her and Bernie Sanders, who's really not going to attack Clinton directly. So uh, that's another point. Four, Sanders now has greatly increased chance of winning all of the remaining Democratic primaries and caucuses. This is true. They are Oregon, West Virginia, Montana, South Dakota, Kentucky, North Dakota, and California. Uh, he's within single digits in New Jersey. So, yeah, I mean, now we got New Mexico in there. Uh, he's in a good spot. And uh, five, the Democrats will have a contested convention and the Republicans won't. So there's, there's a little issue with the contested convention and what could possibly happen. But we're going to show up there with a whole bunch of leverage and a whole bunch of power. And with a lot of reasons for Hillary to recognize that, or for the, national, for the Democratic National Party, for the superdelegates to recognize that they stand a better chance of keeping their jobs with Bernie Sanders in November than they do with Trump in November. And that's really what it comes down to. All right. They stand a better chance with Bernie than they do with Trump that the Democrats in general stand a better chance with Bernie than they do with Trump, and therefore they will flop over to his side. So uh, that's where it stands. That's the harsh reality. Uh, Bernie's not facing uh, a possible FBI indictment, which has already been recommended, by the way, and if it were anybody else, would have happened swiftly, would have been done. 
We know that. She's just the queen being protected by the establishment. How late's Bernie going to be? You think he's speaking to an overflow crowd? Wouldn't surprise me. 375 here. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. What are you guys saying? Let's see. Uh, G. Cooley and I just got uh, a call and someone from the campaign is bringing a Bernie yard sign over this afternoon. Nice. This is in Northern California. That's badass. On Fort Dork. The gals at work, uh, we're talking about how none of us want children because the earth is broken. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, oh, stream is starting. Bernie's up. Holy cow. Let's cut right to it. That was fast. That was fast, everybody. Give me one second, and we will bring this up. Can alone do what has to be done to protect working families and the middle class, the children of the elderly. Can do it alone. We need the American people to understand that democracy is not a spectator sport. I know, I know enough about Kentucky to know you have a great history of basketball teams here. And if you're watching a basketball game, that's a spectator sport. Democracy is not a spectator sport. You've got millions of Americans who are sitting around and they're moaning and they're groaning about this or that. But this world and this country are not going to change just by moaning and groaning. you got to stand up and fight back. And what the political revolution that this campaign represents is about is saying that millions of people from coast to coast have got to stand up and demand a government that represents all of us, not just the 1%. Now, I think the reason why this campaign has gone so far, you know, when we began this campaign, we were considered to be a fringe candidacy. And a lot of the experts said, well, Bernie, you comb your hair really well. And you got this $3,000 suit on. Just kidding, I don't know. It's about a $200 suit, I think. But nonetheless, nonetheless, despite your hair, you're probably not going to become president because your ideas are too bold. They are too radical. We have won the 18th state of this country. See, and with your help, Kentucky will be the 20th state. Because we're going to win West Virginia in between. Now, the reason I think we have taken the establishment by surprise. And that is one way of phrasing it. because we are doing something that is not done in contemporary American politics. We are treating the American people with intelligence and with respect, and we are telling the truth. Now, as all of you know, within our own personal lives or within the political life of the nation, the truth is not always pleasant. But unless we face up to the realities of our nation and our own lives, 
It is impossible for us to go forward. We cannot sweep the major issues facing us under the rug and then think we are going to advance. with you a little bit about some of the real issues which you may not see on the television and that's another part of the problem you must you have got to what democracy is about what thinking outside of the box and outside of the status quo is you have got to go into your own hearts and your own minds and you determine what the most important issues are TV is not going to give it to you, and the front pages of the papers probably won't give it to you. You've got to make that decision. issue that I feel passionately about, and I speak as the former chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs, and I've talked to some great people, and I know that you have here in Kentucky a very proud military history, and let's thank all of the veterans. And the men and women in our armed forces. But I have talked to veterans going way back to World War II. And I have talked to brave and wonderful people who put their lives on the line to defend our way of life. And at the center of our way of life as Americans, is the understanding that we are a proud democratic society. Now, democracy in its essence is not a complicated idea. What democracy is about is you have a vote, and you got a vote, and you got a vote, and you got a vote. One person, one vote. Democracy is not about super PACs and billionaires buying elections. And what we are increasingly seeing in the last number of years, especially as a result of this disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision, decision, as you know, was about. It said to the wealthiest people and the largest corporations in America, it said, well, you guys already own much of the economy. Now we're going to allow you to own the United States government. <laughs> Together, we are going to overturn Citizens United. Together, we are going to create a nation in which we have not one of the lowest voter turnouts of any major country, but one of the highest voter turnouts. Now, voting is very important, but democracy goes beyond voting. Every person here is an extraordinarily powerful person if you use that power. So I would hope that everybody here rethinks the role that they can play in a democratic society. Now, it is not just overturning Citizens United. We have got to work over time to end voter suppression that many Republican governors. We need to increase the participation of ordinary people in the political process. We need to make it easier for people to vote, not harder. And at the end of the day, we should join other countries in understanding that if somebody in this country is a citizen, is 18 years of age, you have the right to vote, end of discussion. But our fight is 
is not just reforming a corrupt campaign finance system. Our fight is ending a rigged economy. What a rigged economy is about is the fact that today in America, the top one-tenth of one percent, not one percent, one-tenth of one percent, now owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. A rigged economy is where over the last 25 years there has been a massive transfer of wealth from the middle class to the very, very wealthiest people in this country. A rigged economy is when the 20 wealthiest people in this country own more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans. A rigged economy is when one family, the wealthiest family in this country, the Walton family, owns more wealth than the bottom 40% of the American people. One family owns $149 billion in wealth. And you want to hear what's ironic about that? What's ironic about that is that the Walton family owns Walmart. Walmart, as you know, is the largest private sector employer in America. Walmart pays wages that are so low that many of their employees are forced to go on food stamps and Medicaid. And you know, and who pays taxes for those food stamps and Medicaid? You do. So you have this absurd irony, and this is the essence of a rigged economy where the working families of this country are subsidizing the workers of the company owned by the wealthiest family in America. The middle class of this country should not be subsidizing a family worth $149 billion. You know, I have heard a lot of Republican governors and senators talk about the need for welfare reform, getting people to stop ripping off the welfare system. Turns out that the largest beneficiary of welfare in America, getting billions of dollars from the taxpayers, is the Walton family. And I say to them, get off of welfare, pay your workers a living wage. economy is when I was in Indiana the other day meeting with workers who work for the Carrier Corporation. They make air conditioners and they make furnaces. And recently they got a notice. Somebody stood up at a meeting like this and said, oh, by the way, we're shutting down plants in Indiana. 2,100 workers are going out on the street because we're going to Mexico where we're paying people there $3 an hour. That's a rigged economy. The economy is when in Kentucky and in Vermont, Indiana, all over this country, corporations show their contempt for American workers, shut down factory after factory, and move abroad to find the cheapest possible labor on this planet they can. A rigged economy is when large multinational corporations make billions of dollars a year in profit and in a given year stash their profits in the Cayman Islands and in other tax havens and end up not paying a nickel in federal taxes. A rigged economy is when today mom is out working 40 hours a week, dad's out working, the kids are all working and yet families still do not have enough money to put bread on the table and to take care of their basic needs. A rigged economy is asking why 40 years ago, 
Before the explosion of technology in the global economy, one breadwinner could work 40 hours a week, earn enough money to take care of the family, while today we need two breadwinners who earn less disposable. I was at the Vatican a few weeks ago. Because I have a whole lot of respect for Pope Francis and I attended and I attended a conference on the subject of how we create a moral economy, a moral economy. And that is an economy that works for the children, that works for the sick, that works for the elderly, that works for the poor, that works for the middle class, not just a handful of billionaires. And with your help, that is what we are going to create. This is the wealthiest country in the history of the world today. But nobody knows it because almost all of the new income and wealth is going to the 1%. Our job, and we can do it, is to create an economy that works for all of us, not just a handful on the top. Now what do we do? How do we, how do we accomplish that goal? And it's not really very complicated. Yes. No? <laughs> we work together is how we do it. All right. Start off, and again, what I am asking of you, and I'm begging you, think outside of the box, think outside of the status quo. Question number one. And to go forward, we've got to ask some important questions. Do we have any psychologists here? Okay, we got some. What psychologists will tell you is the most important years of a human being's development are zero through four, right? We all know that. That's when a human being, to a significant degree, develops emotionally, develops intellectually. And yet stop and think about the dysfunctional child care and pre-K system we have in America today. Ask yourself why. Why does it happen that in Vermont and in Kentucky, what a beautiful baby you have right there, yes. what this campaign is about, that baby. So the question is, why is it that in Vermont and in Kentucky and all over this country, working families are searching frantically to find high quality, affordable childcare? Why? Why does that have to be? Why are we not, as a nation, creating the best child care pre-K system in the world? And that means bringing people into child care who are great teachers, who are well-paid, well-trained, and well-respected. We create jobs, we make sure that our kids have a great head start in life, we make sure that parents feel good when they leave their kids in the morning and they go out to work and we create hundreds of thousands of decent paying jobs. That is a priority. And then we ask ourselves, well, what about working people? How are they doing? Well, here is the fact. The fact is that today, millions of workers are working longer hours for lower wages than used to be the case. Male and female workers are making hundreds of dollars a year less in inflation adjusted for dollars than used to be the case. 
which tells me that when you have a minimum federal minimum wage of seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour what you got is a starvation wage which must be raised now again this is not a radical idea. When somebody works 40 hours a week in America, that person should not be living in poverty. We've got to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And what that will mean what that will mean is that millions of men and women today who are struggling will have at least a minimum level of security and dignity. They will be able to take care of their families and not live in abject poverty. And I want to tell you a story about how real change comes about, because that is the theme of this entire campaign, having the guts to fight for real change. If we were here in this room five years ago, no time at all, and somebody jumps up and says, Bernie, you know, this seven and a quarter minimum wage is awful, and it's got to be raised to $15 an hour, mark my words, the person next to her would have said, $15 an hour, you're out of your mind, that's too high. You want to double the minimum wage. Maybe eight bucks, maybe 10 bucks, we can't make it to 15 bucks an hour. But, but, do you know what happened? And this is how change takes place. Workers in the fast food industry, in McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, they went out on strike, and I was proud to walk the picket lines with them. They stood up and they fought back. And then you know what happened? Two, three years ago in Seattle, Washington, they passed the $15 a minimum wage. And in Seattle, and in Los Angeles, and in San Francisco, and in Oregon, California, New York State. And now the idea of a $15 an hour minimum wage doesn't seem all that radical. And if I have anything to do with it as President of the United States, we're going to have 15 bucks an hour in every state in this country. We're talking not only about starvation wages that millions of Americans are working for, we're also talking about the fact that women in America are making 79 cents on the dollar. Well, you know what? Women don't want 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. They want the whole damn dollar. Every man here will stand with the women in the fight for pay equity. And by the way, by the way, when we talk about our economy and our needs, there is one country in the industrialized world that does not guarantee paid family and medical leave. You're living in that country. Think outside of the box, outside of the status quo. Ask yourself this. Is it okay for a woman in Kentucky today or in Vermont who is a working class woman or a low income woman who has a baby today is it right that that woman should be forced to separate herself 
from that baby in a week or two to go back to work. Are you going to fight with me to make sure we end up? The United States has got to join every other major country and many poor countries who understand that a mom and a dad have the right to stay home with their newborn baby. And that is why we are going to pass three months paid family and medical leave. in Flint, Michigan a couple of months ago and as you may have read the president was just there I think yesterday and what he was looking at and what I was looking at is an enormous and terrible American tragedy and that is children in that city being poisoned with lead in the water that they drank. It's not just Flint, Michigan. We have hundreds of communities all over this country, including communities in my own state, who are worried very much about the quality of the water that they are drinking. Right here as well? Yeah. Okay. We have wastewater plants all over America that are inadequate and outdated. We used to have in America the number one cutting edge rail system in the world. That's no longer the case. Our levees and our dams and our airports need an enormous amount of work. Our roads and our bridges need work. We can create 13 million great jobs from engineers to blue collar labor to architects rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. And we can pay for that trillion dollar investment by doing away with outrageous corporate loopholes. When we think about the economy, we have got to deal with an issue that is not a sexy issue, it's an issue media very rarely talks about, but it is a very important issue, and that is our disastrous trade policies. You are looking at a former congressman and a United States Senate senator who opposed every one of these awful trade agreements. Since 2001, we have lost as a nation some 60,000 factories and millions of good paying jobs and a lot of that has to do with disastrous trade policies. Since the passage of NAFTA and permanent normal trade relations with China, Kentucky has lost over 44,000 manufacturing jobs. In 2014, Fruit of the Loom shut down its last manufacturing plant in Jamestown, Kentucky, throwing 600 workers out on the street and moving to Honduras and exploiting the people there. At its height, Fruit of the Loom employed over 11,000 workers here in Kentucky. But what we have seen is corporate greed saying if I can make five bucks more by shutting down a plant in Kentucky and moving to China or Honduras or Mexico, that is what I'll do. If elected president, we will change that corporate behavior. Corporate America 
has got to begin showing respect for their workers, not treating them with contempt. This campaign has been listening to the American people, not wealthy campaign contributors. We have been listening to young people. And one of the most gratifying aspects of this campaign is that when we began, many of the pundits and the political experts, their view was that young people were not interested in politics, not interested in government. They were too busy with their video games or whatever. Well, over the last year, it turns out those experts were not quite right. And what I'm very proud of, what I'm very proud of is that in virtually every primary and caucus we have engaged in, including yesterday in Indiana, we won two-thirds of the people 45 years of age or younger. In other words, the ideas that we are talking about are the ideas for the future of America. talk to young people, here is what I hear. Number one, young people ask me a very simple but poignant question. And that is, how does it happen that for the first time in the modern history of America, our younger generation, if we do not turn this around, will have a lower standard of living than their parents? Now my dad came to this country at the age of 17 without a nickel in his pocket and he never made any money. But he and my mom worked really hard so that my brother and I could do better than they financially. And that is what America is. That is the American dream. The American dream is parents working hard so their kids will have a better life than they did. And I will be damned, I will be damned if we are going to see that American dream die now. And the second point that young people are making to me is they say, Bernie, you know, our parents and our teachers and our community said, go out and get the best education that you can. It's good for your life, it's good for the community, it's good for the country. And that is exactly right. We need the best educated workforce in the world. When you think outside of the box and outside of the status quo, what you automatically think is creating a nation in which all of our people can get the best education they can. And that is kind of a no-brainer. Now, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, you graduated high school, you got a high school degree, the likelihood is you could go out and get yourself a pretty good middle class job. But over the years, the economy has changed, education has changed, technology has changed. People today need more education than they used to. In many ways, a college degree today is the equivalent of what a high school degree was 40 years ago. And that is why I believe that when we talk about public education, free public education, it's not good enough to talk about first grade through 12th grade anymore. We have got, when we talk about public education, 
to understand that public colleges and universities should be tuition free. allow anybody to tell you that that is a radical idea. It is not a radical idea. It is a very common sense idea that already exists in other countries around the world, in Germany, in Scandinavia, other countries. Those countries understand that it is in the best long-term interests of their economy that they invest in their young people. And here is what making public colleges and universities tuition-free also does. And this is very revolutionary. Right now, I grew up in a family, as I said, didn't have a lot of money. My parents never went to college. All over Kentucky, all over Vermont, you have families, low-income, working-class families, parents never went to college. Many of those children today, in the fourth grade and the sixth grade here in Kentucky, the idea of them going thinking that they can go to college is as likely as them thinking they're going to go to the moon. It is outside of their world purview. They were born poor, they expect to live poor, they never in a million years think that they, children of low income families, of working class families, will be able to get a college education. What I want to see happen in this country, I want every teacher to know it, every parent to know it, every kid to know it. That if those boys and girls take school seriously, work hard, do well, regardless of the income of their families, they will get a college education. And there is another issue directly related to that. And that is we got millions of people in this country for being crushed by high levels of student debt. Anybody here with student debt? Well, welcome to the crowd. There are millions of Americans in your shoes. And I have talked to people all over this country. Young doctor in Burlington, Vermont, $300,000 in debt. Dentist in Iowa, $400,000 in debt. Young man dropped out of college in Iowa, $60,000 in debt after two years. And that is why I believe that people with student debt today should be able to refinance their loans at the lowest interest rates they can find. Now people say to me, well, you know, Bernie, you're Santa Claus, you're a nice guy. Giving out free tuition at public colleges and universities, you're going to substantially lower student debt. What else are you going to give away? All right. How are you going to pay for it, Bernie? Well, let me tell you how we're going to pay for it. And again, and again, this requires thinking outside of the box. It requires having the guts to stand up to the billionaire class. Two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. The greed, the recklessness, and the illegal behavior of Wall Street nearly destroyed this economy. of people in Kentucky, Vermont, and around this country lost their jobs, their homes, their life savings. And the folks on Wall Street with their billions and billions of dollars went crawling to Congress and they said, bail us out. And a 
case by vote, Congress did bail out Wall Street. Well, I think today it is time to impose a tax on Wall Street speculation. which will bring in more than enough money to pay for free public college and university and will lower student debt. Now this campaign is not just listening to young people, we're listening to disabled veterans and seniors. And I hope you all share with me the belief that a great nation is not judged by how many billionaires or nuclear weapons it has. But a great nation is judged by how it treats the weakest and most vulnerable amongst us. Today in Kentucky, in Vermont and again all over this country, we got millions of seniors, disabled veterans, people with disabilities, trying to make it on eleven, twelve thousand dollars a year social security. And you know what? You can't make it on eleven or twelve thousand dollars a year social security. Now the Republicans, many of my Republican colleagues, their solution is to cut social security. some bad news for them. We're not going to cut Social Security. We're going to expand Social Security benefits. I am a member of the United States Committee on the Environment. Let me tell you what I think most of you know. I have talked to scientists throughout our country and throughout the world. Climate change is real. It is caused by human activity. It is already causing devastating harm to our country and around the world. In my view, we have a moral responsibility to leave this planet in a way that is healthy and habitable to future generations. And that means transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. Now I understand, I understand that when you do that, when you make that transformation of our energy system, there will be workers who will be hurt. That is why in the climate change legislation that I've introduced, we have $41 billion to protect those workers in terms of to protect the coal miners and the other workers to make sure that they get the job training and the jobs and the education and the extended unemployment that they need. And we have billions in that bill to invest in those communities that have been impacted. We're not going to leave these workers high and dry. When we think outside of the box and outside of the status quo, we ask ourselves a very simple question. Why is it that the United States of America is the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a right? So let me, I have been attacked for saying this. So let me say it again so that there is no ambiguity. I believe that health care is a right of all people, not a privilege. And that is 
why I believe we have got to move forward to a Medicare for all single payer program. Our campaign is listening to brothers and sisters in the Latino community. There are 11 million undocumented people in this country. They want, they need, and I believe we must pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. And if the Congress does not do its job, I will use the executive powers that the President has to make it. This campaign is listening to our brothers and sisters in the African American community. And they are asking me a very simple but important question. How does it happen that we can spend trillions of dollars on a war in Iraq we never should have gotten into? But somehow we don't have the money to rebuild the crumbling inner cities of America. Why do we continue to tolerate youth unemployment in inner cities of 40 or 50 percent, child poverty of 35 percent, people paying 50, 60 percent of their incomes in housing because there is no affordable housing? Together we are going to change our national priorities and invest in those communities that need the help. This campaign is listening to a people whose pain is almost never heard, and that is the Native American community. I think all of you know, all of you know, that from before this country became a country, when the first settlers came here, the Native American people were lied to, they were cheated, and treaties they negotiated were broken. We owe the Native American people a debt that we can never fully repay. They have, they have taught us lessons that are absolutely invaluable. Lessons like understanding that as human beings, we are part of nature. We must... We must live with nature. We cannot continue destroying nature. Because if we continue destroying nature, we are ultimately destroying the human species. Now, I know that there is a lot of nervousness around this country that Donald Trump may become president. going to happen because every poll that I have seen in the last month or two, including one today, I think was CNN, that had us 16 points ahead of Donald Trump. But 
That's not only true of national polls, it's true of state polls. State after state has us beating Trump by very large margins. But, you know, polls are polls. But what is more important, I think, is that Trump does not become president because the American people will never elect a candidate who insults people every single day in incredibly ugly ways. We are not, as a nation, we're not going to elect a president who insults Mexicans and Latinos. Who insults Muslims. Who, ins who insults women and veterans. Who insults African Americans. I hope that all of you remember, some people have forgotten, that before he was running for president, Trump was a leader in the so-called Bertha movement. Remember that? And what that Bertha movement was about was a very, very ugly and vicious effort to delegitimize the first African-American president we have ever had. But Trump will not become president above and beyond all of that because the American people understand a lesson that we have struggled with for decades, but I think we are making progress on, and that is the understanding that diversity is our strength. because we are black and white and Latino and Asian American and Native Americans. We are gay, we are straight. We are men, we are women. Some of us were born in this country, some of us immigrated to this country. But the American people understand that as Americans, when we come together, that always trumps tearing us apart. And the American people understand that we are a strong nation. When my family is there for your family in your time of trouble, and your family is there for my family in our time of trouble, that as a people we are prepared to support each other and help each other, and that that togetherness always trumps selfishness. And perhaps most profoundly, the American people fully understand what the great religions of the world, whether it is Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, whatever it may be, have always taught us. And that is that at the end of the day, love trumps hatred. is about transforming America. This campaign is about creating a political revolution.
This campaign is about thinking big, not small. This campaign is about telling the billionaire class that they cannot have it all. On May 17th, there's going to be a very important Democratic primary here in Kentucky. What I've learned throughout this campaign is we win elections, we win primaries and caucuses when voter turnout is high, and we don't do well when voter turnout is low. I would ask all of you, on May 17th, let us see Kentucky having the biggest turnout in its history. Kentucky help lead this nation into the political revolution. Thank you all. All right, everybody, that was another badass Bernie rally. And uh, I like how he continues to change up his speech and uh, what we are, who we are. I love that part. That was fantastic. Just uh, amazing. And, and uh, uh, there was at least one awesome moment in there, if not two. I'm not sure. Uh, there, there was the, the guy held up the baby. That was pretty awesome. That was incredible. And then something else happened, but I didn't quite catch it. We, we had Now it's going to become... Uh, uh, it sounds like it's going to become common, like uh, uh, huge. Everybody goes huge in the crowd. <laughs> so when he mentions uh, uh, the one uh, percent, when he mentions uh, 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 the establishment, uh, somebody's going to say "f," uh, you know, f "fuck the establishment," and Bernie's going to go. That's a great way to put it. I love that because that kind of repetitive narrative is what cements. Uh, the campaign. That's just beautiful. That, that's, that's the battle cry that needs to be carried out. And uh, we can all carry out that battle cry uh, as we phone bank and face bank, although I don't suppose they're going to write uh, fuck the establishment as part of the phone bank script. But um, that's not the point. The point is we can do everything we can, have a big voice, uh, and Bernie has shown us that we can do this. It's been amazing. We have financed our own uh, uh, candidate. We've brought him uh, to the forefront. And Hillary Clinton is now collapsing under the weight of her own lies. And uh, she's been caught over and over again in scandal after scandal. We're on our way. If you want to beat Trump, and Trump at this point, I, I saw a lot of people saying, uh, I, I was looking at the dropout Hillary uh, hashtag, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, you only got Trump and Bernie with transcripts at this point. Uh, both have said they don't have any. And, you know, if Trump, I don't know if Trump's done these speeches to Wall Street, I, I, who knows. But even if he has, uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to release those transcripts. <laughs> he's he's going to attack, he's going to beat the shit out of Hillary Clinton. I'm excited for this next round because if he just dishevels her, if the Republican Party goes after her, Bernie's not going to have to do a lot of work in that regard. All he has to do is reach out to the American people and continue to tell the truth, right? So, uh... It's, it's, it's going to be fun. Uh, wrapping up with comments. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, comment mods. Thank you, guys. Who do we have in there today? I, I, I always, I, I'm, I'm trying to get better at looking at this stuff. I'm figuring out who the hell is there. And I said their names earlier. We have uh, Steph, Bad Wolf, uh, Sekmar, and Ryan. Thank you guys so much for that hard work. Uh, wrenches, comment mods, uh, monitors. That, there's so many people that do so many things in this amazing volunteer group. And we're one of hundreds, if not thousands of volunteer groups around the world that are organized for Bernie Sanders, organized for the planet, organized for the people, because there's really no difference there, right? We've got to act fast. You saw at the beginning uh, of this rally before Bernie got in there that uh, uh, we were looking at what's going on in Canada. And uh, wow, 
I, I, uh, I know Canada is better prepared to take care of that kind of stuff, but I, I know they weren't expecting it. And the, the irony that the, what, what Fort Mc, McMurray is, was where the, uh, the, the sand oil, uh, or the oil sands, whatever they call it, the, 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 the uh, fossil fuel industry is where these people uh, lived and it's gone. So I, 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 you know, hope all of the, I hope the people are okay, and I hope the people have a place to go, and that's 80,000 people displaced in one instant. One instant. How many instances have we had in 2016 so far, and we're just getting started? Temperatures in March were insane around the world. We haven't even seen what summer's going to do. Holy shit, hold on to your hats. Climate change is going to fuck us up. And it's a good thing that's going to do it fast. Faster than everybody thought. Because we really only have about 10 years to get our shit together. Good thing engineers tell us we can completely remove ourselves from fossil fuel and convert to renewables in 10 years. That's about all the time we got. And it's going to get worse for those 10 years. Nothing's going to get better. It's only going to get worse. We have nothing in place, no plans, and no ability to make things better. Understand that. What's happening with the weather right now will continue to get worse and worse. So the reason I'm bringing you all down and being a bummer after watching this great Bernie rally is because I want to put things back in perspective again that we have to do everything we can to get Bernie Sanders in office. Every vote counts. Guam is coming up. West Virginia is coming up. Oregon's coming up. A couple other states coming up. We got... We have to win them all. We have to win as many delegates as we can. We have to transform our government as quickly as possible. And we have to mobilize for climate change. That's not going to happen with an establishment government. It's not going to happen with a Republican government. Yeah. And we can't just hope that some mega climate disaster happens strictly to the 1% because we know that's not going to happen. We've got to act fast. We've got to get them to act fast. So uh, Tomorrow... Newsroom, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And there's a Bernie rally somewhere in there. Let's see. I had this in from Nico this morning. What is the Bernie rally tomorrow? Today it was Lexington. Tomorrow, a future to believe in. In uh, Charleston. Let's see if I can't make this a little more legible for you guys. There's this one. Future to believe in in Charleston. And that's happening... Uh, well, doors open at noon. That's happening a little after that. I'm not sure which one of these I'm doing. I There's another one, Future to Believe in, uh, Rally, Morgantown. Jesse's nodding her head and shaking her head. No, not this one. So it's probably this one, uh, Rally in Charleston. I, I think that's what we talked about. And uh, early one. We're doing the early one. All right. So we're doing the early one, everybody. Join us for that. We'll have the newsroom in the morning, and we'll talk about... Uh, more about uh, what's going on. Sean King, if you haven't noticed in that dropout Hillary hashtag, Sean King just pushed out an article about uh, why if Bernie Sanders is really the only option to beat Trump at this point in time. Hillary, not so much. A uh, lot of articles coming out. Help us win. Share that narrative. Find these links. They're in the description of this event. And I drop all those links in the newsroom in the morning as well. This is the Air Force. This is our propaganda machine. The difference between ours and the establishments is we're actually telling the truth, which makes it so much easier to do our jobs. Simply push out the articles, tell the truth, and we will win. So keep doing what we're doing, everybody. I'm going to go out with... Uh, I was very, very torn. I'm torn between two things because of what's going on with climate and because of what Bernie says. But I ran the climate thing recently, and we're going to really hit a heavy, heavy, heavy climate day this friday for frack off friday um join me for that uh, it's it's there's a lot going down we've had a lot of uh, climate disasters happen very very recently and there's more to come and we're going to watch a video a 14 minute uh plus video uh, that is uh it's called a disgruntled royalty and it is way heavy but we're going to watch that together and then kind of debrief so that we all don't go run out and jump off a cliff uh, but uh, join me for that Frack Off Friday. Tomorrow, Thursday, we've got uh, a Charleston gig with Bernie Sanders. Newsroom before that. Feel the burn, everybody. Thank you for being here. 
I suppose I should be polite and actually address some of these beautiful questions I see landed in here. Let me do that real quick. Uh, I, I, I apologize for not paying attention. Let's see. Uh, Stevie P, why does Hillary get away with so much? That's a great question. It's because we let our government, um, we let our government take over. We were dumb. We were complacent. Let's see. What else do we have here? There was one more right here. Yo, Gonzalez, how many people are there? That's a good question. I never got a, I never saw anything posted about that. So I have no idea how many people were there. It'd be nice to find out if anybody has a number. Did anybody see a number? Uh, early one, a warning for frack off Friday would be good. <laughs> did I just do that? Is that what I did? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I don't know what the, I don't know what the numbers are. Uh, that's, that's a good thing to know. Sounded like a great crowd. Sounded excited. I'm, I'm excited to see what happens in Kentucky. Uh, West Virginia, Bernie's up by eight points, or that was the last poll. I think the, there were two polls, one's earlier, one's later. Uh, this point spread on that brings uh, Bernie's total to some significant gain. But uh, I don't trust any of the polls, especially the ones that show Bernie favorable, because Hillary always manages to mangle those. And Nate Silver has no clue what's going on these days. So don't look at the polls. Just know that every vote counts and we do not stop. And we just need to move forward, continue to move forward. Work, work, work. All right, uh, 460 cell. Oh, wow, 460 of you. Thank you for staying here. Thank you very much for staying here. All right, I'm gonna get the hell out of here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it, subscribe if you haven't. That's the biggest thing that can help us is to subscribe. The more people we have on these channels, the more power we have against YouTube should they choose to be uh, establishment -y. And that's all I'll say on that. We're gonna go out with... Um, Bernie Sanders, religion. Because I want everybody to remember what this man is about. And we're going to play one of my favorite tunes ever. Maybe we'll play it tomorrow. Maybe we'll play it Friday. Um, Symphony of Science. I want you to think about what Bernie Sanders says here and what Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye and other famous scientists have said. That we are all connected. We are all connected together in a symphony of science. And Bernie Sanders gets that. And the only way we're going to survive is if we work together really fast to save the planet. So stand strong. Feel the burn, everybody. See you tomorrow. This is what I believe. Every great religion in the world, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, essentially comes down to do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. As a 22-year-old kid getting arrested in Chicago fighting segregation, I believed it in my whole life. That we are in this together, not just not words. The truth is, at some level, when you hurt, when your children hurt, I hurt. I hurt. And it's very easy to turn our backs on kids who are hungry or veterans who are sleeping out on the street. And we can develop a psyche, a psychology which says, I don't have to worry about them. All I'm going to worry about myself, I need to make another $5 billion. Hey, this whole world is me. I need more and more. I don't care about anybody else. I believe that what human nature is about is that everybody in this room impacts everybody else in all kinds of ways that we can't even understand. It's beyond intellect. It's a spiritual, emotional thing. When we say that that child who is hungry is my child, when we do the right thing, when we try to treat people with respect and dignity, I think we are more human. That's my religion, that's what I believe in. And I think, you know, most people around the world, whatever their, their, their religion, their color, share that belief that we are in it together as human beings. If we destroy 
the planet because we don't deal with climate change, trust me, we are all in it together. That is what my spirituality is about. Huge.